to show all girls that their value and potential is infinite. We clear a woman's way. We don't fear the day she steps into the light because we are with her. Because we are with her every step of that fight. Women have a special opportunity to live the revolution. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down, all alone. These women, together, ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And the men better let them. You have to stop asking for permission. You have to stop, you have to stop. To stop, to stop asking for permission. Women will have achieved true equality when men share with them the responsibility. responsibility of bringing up the next generation. Doubt and dreams can't ride together. Each will take down the other. It is said that girls with dreams become women with vision. Because it isn't enough to simply talk, talk about, about equality. equality. Let us work at it together, starting now. That's the history of the world. His story is told. Hers isn't. I feel that has to change, and women are going to have to change it. Human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights once and for all. Somewhere downtown, wish for a better life. Unlock the intelligence, unlock the passion, unlock all of the great things that they hold within themselves. Dream with ambition, lead with conviction, and see yourselves in a way that others may not, simply because they've never seen it before. But know that we will applaud you every step of the way. Hashtag her voice matters. Historically, women have had to speak louder to have their voices heard. 33,000 girls become child brides every day. 40% of women have suffered sexual harassment in the workplace. Only six countries give women equal legal work rights as men. This International Women's Day, join and care. Join care. Join care to make these injustices history once and for all. The words we say and the actions we take today can make a difference for her tomorrow. Share her voice and amplify it around the world. Care.org. Waste isolation power plant threatens New Mexico neighborhoods. It's Women's History Month. War in Ukraine and the ugliness that makes it even worse. These stories, great music, and more just ahead. Good morning, Albuquerque. It's Saturday morning, and that means it's time for another edition of That Saturday Show. Brought to you by the Albuquerque Center for Peace and Justice, your voice and your advocate for social justice. I'm Jim Harvey, your host, and we have a great show in store for you today. First, a few announcements. Studio 508 will be the scene of a special fundraiser for Sarita Gonzalez. She's the daughter of Albuquerque Poet Laureate Manuel Gonzalez. And Sarita's dealing with a health issue right now that is going to require some surgery, and we want to gather around her in love and donations to help her stem that tide. So that event is taking place March 18th at Studio 508 from 6.30 to 8.30. Let's be there for Sarita. Happy birthday to civil rights leader Andrew Young from SCLC. He turned 90 on Wednesday, and we wish him the best. We're celebrating Women's History Month, and today we feature social justice hero and leader Mary McLeod Bethune. Here's a little information about her. Mary McLeod Bethune, who was also close friends and confidant of, confidant of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was a very powerful influence on the 
civil rights legislation that came out of the Roosevelt administration. She and the First Lady shared mutual goals that led not only to a uni unique relationship between women of markedly different backgrounds, but to a partnership of, of, as advocates for social change in this country. Mary McLeod Bethune was born in 1875. She was an American educator and civil rights leader best known for starting the African American Students School in Daytona Beach, Florida. Eventually, it became known as Bethune Cookman University, and it still stands to this very day. South Carolina, uh, parents who had been slaves were very proud of the work that their daughter did. Bethune was also active in women's clubs, and her leadership in them allowed her to become a nationally prominent individual. She worked for the election of Roosevelt in 1932, sharing the concerns of black people with, Rose, uh, with the Roosevelt administration. We're very proud to highlight Mary McLeod Bethune. Now, <clears throat> since we're on the subject of social justice, I want to make a personal observation that angers and disturbs my spirit. It seems that racism doesn't take a holiday, even in the midst of a vicious war. And over the last week, I've received numerous accounts of black people, many of them African students, studying in the Ukraine. And they've been subjected to raw and unfiltered racism, being forced off trains, off buses, to the back of trains, to the back of buses, and in some cases even denied the opportunity to board to ride to safety in the face of that war. Those students pour millions of dollars into the Ukrainian economy, and they're treated less than human while trying to flee like the rest of the Ukrainians. Get your heads out of your butts, Ukraine. Everybody needs the same. And finally, the Center for Peace and Justice joins Veterans for Peace as we say farewell to our beloved Herb Hoffman. Herb passed last week, and he was a longtime member and leader in Vets for Peace, and was always right out front on the important issues of the day. Herb, we're going to miss you. We treasure and value your contributions. Now, let's get some good news. Thank you, and welcome to Good News News. I'm your correspondent, Hassani Olujimi, and I'm Gugu for Good News. The goal of this segment is to inspire and uplift you, the viewer, with nothing but good news. Our two stories come from our favorite friends at somethinggood.com. Our first story is titled, Go Have Fun With Your Dreams. Let's take a look. you back from what you want to do. Kinsley Curley is a young cancer survivor and an old and soul here, here, with big dreams and even bigger personality. And you didn't invite me. At the ripe old age of eight, she has things figured out. I used to be like a little shy, but I feel like now I've opened my wings and now I like I'm brave and I'm, I'll do anything that is scary. Fearless indeed. Perhaps because of what happened as her life was just getting started. Kinsley was three years old back in April of 2017, and she was getting a bath one night, and we discovered that her stomach was very large on one side. We took her into urgent care, took us to an ER and a hospital, and from there they diagnosed her with a Wilms tumor, which is a tumor on her kidney. It was really fast, and all of a sudden they're wheeling her back for surgery to remove that, that kidney and that tumor. Then came 32 weeks of chemo, eight rounds of radiation, and long hospital stays. Kinsley lost her hair, 
but never her infectious spirit. We can do it, we can do it, we can, I'll do it, yeah. She's using her voice to inspire as an ambassador for MD Anderson. It's fun to raise money to help kids that were just like me. Go have fun with your dream. Nothing can ever hold you back from what you want to be. Now, isn't that good news? <laughs> Let's explore a little more about the power of helping hands. Here we go. It's been an eye opener for me. For the president of the Val Verde Border Humanitarian Coalition, this was a first. It looked like a third world country, maybe even a fourth world country if there is one. Thousands of Haitian men, women, and children waiting for a chance at getting asylum. Far from the political chaos and the earthquake devastation they left behind. And there's a lot of people that, that just uh, need a welcome. Even if it's in the form of pallets and pallets of water, juice or Gatorade, as well as sandwiches made by faith-based volunteers for the Haitian arrivals, U.S. Border Patrol, and DPS troopers. These Del Rio pastors say for now they could use San Antonio's help. The Val Verde Border Humanitarian Coalition's website has where to donate monetary contributions and an Amazon wish list for food, drinks, baby food, diapers, and other items they could use, unless otherwise specified what they don't need. We don't have the space for clothing, so we're trying to avoid clothing at all costs. Whatever political divide exists, they say compassion for others can go a long way in filling in the gap. Whether we are on opposite sides of a political spectrum shouldn't determine the way that we respond to one another when someone is in need. Now, isn't that good news? Both of these stories remind me of an inspirational quote that goes like this. Great crises produce great men and great deeds of courage. Now let's step on over to the comedy corner. Here we go. <laughs> A lady was walking down the street to work and she saw a parrot on a perch in front of a pet store. Well, the parrot said to her, hey lady, you're real ugly. Well, the lady was furious. She stormed past the store and went to work. Well, on her way home, she saw the same parrot and it said to her, hey lady, you're really ugly. Well, she was incredibly ticked now. The next day, the same parrot said to her, hey lady, you're really ugly. The lady was so ticked that she went into the store and said that she would sue the store and kill the bird. Well, the store manager replied, well, that's not good. He promised that the parrot wouldn't say it again. So when the lady walked past the store the day after, the parrot called out to her, hey lady. Well, she paused and said, yes. Well, the bird said, you know. As we always say, the best way to turn a frown upside down is to get goo goo for good news. I'm your correspondent, Hassanio Lujimi, and I'll see you right here next time on That Saturday Show with more You Got It Good News. Just a reminder events at the Peace Center for the coming weeks include. The Peace Cafe, which is open every Thursday from 10 to 2. Stop in for some good food, good music, and good conversation. If you're having any rental problems, we've got trained volunteers at the Peace Center ready to step up and help you with your rent problems. So stop in whenever you feel the need. So last week, Veterans for Peace in Santa Fe was joined by Vets for Peace in Albuquerque, along with several endorsing and supporting organizations, including the Peace and Justice Center, to deliver more than 1,000 petition signatures to Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. The petitions call for the governor to block the next WIP dump site from being introduced into our communities. WIP which stands for Waste Isolation Power Plant, proposes to transport nuclear waste through our communities and dump it in another site that will not only pose a health threat to our residential communities, but will make New Mexico the largest nuclear waste dump in the country. We can't have this, folks. We can't have it. The United States government looks at us 
We're already the biggest military reservation in the, in the world, in fact, with military bases everywhere. Now they want to keep dumping nuclear waste in our neighborhoods. I'd like to see what the cancer rates look like as a result of being treated this way. So the press conference was joined by the state representative, Tara Lujan, along with other elected officials who also expressed their concerns for the health and welfare of our people. There's nothing good about nuclear waste, and for that matter, nothing good about how this country uses nuclear energy for power or for weaponry. Let's talk about Los Alamos. We are grateful for this petition and grateful to the organizers, and we hope the governor will follow suit. Now let's take a listen to the press conference. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I think, I think we're ready to start. Um, so uh, I'm James Oyster, or you can call me Jim. Uh, I'm one of the signatories to the petition that was delivered today to the governor. Um, there will be several speakers here, and we want to thank the, the journalists for being here, uh, doing what only they can do. And we want to thank all of the people who are here, all of you, uh, who are, are here to show the governor that we're concerned about this issue and that we would like to have her protect us from the federal overreach regarding the whip. Um, and as the reminder, please, uh, you know, try to maintain some social distance. Six feet is, I think, still what is recommended, but, uh, uh, and wear a mask if you feel, co feel comfortable. All right, so uh, just to, uh, to sort of recap, WIP is the waste isolation power plant. Uh, this was only supposed, this is the only dump for uh, nuclear weapons waste in the nation. And it was supposed to be uh, closed in 2024. That is all the mission that WIP originally had. Uh, so that, that's WIP. Uh, we also want to thank the governor uh, for allowing us uh, to present these more than 1,000 signatures from concerned citizens to her office. Uh, also, uh, I want to say uh, uh, Tara Lujan, Representative Lujan, Lujan was here. Uh, she's not here now, but she was here in solidarity with us. Um, these signatures that I mentioned, uh, you can see on this zip code map, uh, these are all the zip codes that we got signatures from. Now this is not you know, the number of people that signed. This just shows that uh, people from all over the state uh, are concerned uh, about this issue. There will be a question and answer period um, after the speakers present, for those who have more questions, um, the press may pick up press kits from Robin Seidel. There she is. And the press release has also been uh, translated into Spanish. Our first speaker is Commissioner Anna Hansen of District 2. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. Um, I want to start by um, taking a moment of silence for the people of Ukraine who are fighting a deadly fight against a huge nuclear power. I feel that um, it is our responsibility as citizens and residents of New Mexico who are also basically a large nuclear power to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. And so if we could please take a moment of silence for them and also remember that they are, gave up their nuclear weapons for protection from the West. We owe them protection. They did the right thing by giving up their weapons and leading the way. And we in New Mexico could also give up the weapons here. So I think that many of you know I have been a longtime advocate of um, anti-nuclear activity in this state. Uh, 
and making sure that we are protected. Um, concerned citizens for nuclear safety. Um, I was the board chair in 2000. It says concerned citizens of nu for nuclear safety. That is why we are here today, because we want nuclear safety. This transportation route is deeply concerning to me. First of all, it uh, does not protect us here in Santa Fe County. We are going to have waste transported twice through our communities. That is a very serious thing, especially not knowing how it's packaged. We fought years and years to make sure that we had decent true packs to protect the waste, the, the transuranic waste that was coming off of the hill. As many of you probably know, I still continue to fight to get the waste off of the hill. That to me is incredibly important. Um, we have legacy waste up there that must be removed, not, na not 28 years from now, but now it needs to be removed. Um, and so this transportation of um, this waste along our highways and the potential risk of health and safety to our uh, motorists and residents along these uh, routes is substantial. The transportation of nuclear weapon waste will also impact 10 other states, I-40 east from New Mexico to South Carolina and back along I-20 west from South Carolina to New Mexico. This waste, this need, the waste that needs to go to WIP needs to be from legacy waste at Los Alamos, period. And we do not need to be set on the back burner ahead of Idaho and Washington and other states with having their way sent to WIP. Um, I represent District 2 in Santa Fe County. Uh, my, uh, two of my other commissioners uh, in District 4 and 5 uh, also held town halls um, informing people of this issue. We had probably over 200 people turn out for both of those town halls. I held mine uh, at the Nancy Rodriguez Center. And you know, it's, it's so important to spread the word and inform people of this. Um, when Cindy and I had the ability to speak in front of the radioactive and nuclear waste transportation, uh, nuclear waste uh, committee for the roundhouse, they agreed to write a letter. You know, these are important things that um, keep the momentum going. This is another process in keeping the momentum going and making sure that we are bringing this topic to the forefront. Um, we, uh, I have also brought it up at the New Mexico Transportation Committee uh, for the state of New Mexico, which oversees DOT. So these are other places where we can um, get our message out, and we must work to get the message out. Um, so thank you. I, I, I'm going to be brief because there are many other speakers, but I thank you all for being here. Please keep your crane in your prayers and send uh, them love and support. Uh, thank you very much. Muhammad Ali, the greatest, the latest but the greatest. We can thank Ken Burns for a fantastic documentary with commentary brought to you by New Mexico PBS, and it's just for you. This is part two of an important and insightful series. Thank you. No, I will now. Hey, Laurel, let me check in real quick on a time check from the, uh, from the run of show. I feel like I've gotten us off a little bit. Is there something I should be doing right now particularly? Oh, you you're, you're great. Um, we can go to some of the comments um, from the audience, but we we're going to go until 830 and we haven't lost anybody. So just uh, this is a great conversation. Keep going. Okay. Why don't we do a couple comments, see what's in there and uh, maybe some stuff we can chew on. OK, so. well, Rosemary, who joined us for our last conversation, had an interesting comment. She was once told by an international peace activist in the United States 
you have freedom of speech, but you do not have the freedom to hear. Your government keeps you from being able to hear the world's diverse voices. That was the problem when Muhammad Ali went to Africa, and it's the problem now. And um, someone else, and let me see if I can tell, I think um, who it is. Um, when we get, what we get to listen to here is US government propaganda that backs up their foreign policy. So we have some people in the audience that really um, quite agree with uh, what Dr. Reed is um, talking about. And also a couple of them have read his book. So you're, you're, you're getting some readers out there. Um, another interesting one um, is, oh, someone talked about the film, The Good Shepherd. Apparently it's uh, directed by Robert De Niro. And it was kind of a mind-blowing script about, script about the CIA. Um, he got some amazing performances from Angelina Jolie and from Matt Damon and others. So I guess we're getting a recommendation for that film. That's from Stephen James Rubin, or Stephen Jules Rubin, I think. He's a film guy up in Santa Fe, so I trust his judgment. Uh, he's a regular PBS watcher. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate yeah, that. he's been to all of these conversations too. Stephen, mm -hmm. you, you get the, the definitely the prize for being at the most. I like it. Um, I like it. Let's see. Oh, we um, Janice is wishing for closed captioning. I'm sorry. I'm going to work on this. <laughs> Live closed captioning is something that we haven't figured out yet, but we will work on this. I'm so sorry, um, Marsha. We only have the uh, closed captions for the script. Janice, not for, um, for our conversation here, but I am working on that, I promise. Um, so, and Stephen Jules Rubin once again says that this is a very deep conversation. He thinks this is the best one of all four <laughs> so far. Um, if anybody else wants to put anything in um, the chat, I will definitely um, relay it, but in the meantime, um, I'd lo love to hear some more of our panelists' thoughts. Sounds good. Why don't we go to, we haven't heard from Dr. Carpenter in a little bit because it's been so interesting. Um, going, I'm reading from your, your bio again, there's something that jumps out at me that I, I just want to touch, have you touch on. Um, you know, educational and charitable or foundations and organizations in, in foreign companies, uh, foreign companies, foreign countries, uh, is an, another American export that we've been doing for a long time now, you know, exporting how we do things in education, how we do things as democracies, all that kind of stuff. I, I'm curious where we are now in this game. I mean, we've just gone through an interesting dozen years or so where the world's kind of upside down, of course, for obvious reasons in sideways with the United States in a lot of ways uh, than we have been in a lot of years past. How do, how do we do these kind of things now? Are people open to us coming overseas now into their countries and trying to teach them about democracy? Or are people kind of looking at us now and going, there was a window for that, yo. It may, you may, it may have closed. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious what, what your take is on that. Uh, yeah, and I think that that follows on uh, what uh, Professor Reed was, was talking about, uh, looking at America's history in regard to the world. Uh, and um, there's actually a, a great amount of literature about that uh, from uh, writers from Mark Twain to James Baldwin uh, and including Professor Reed, who has a great body of uh, literature about multiculturalism uh, and, um, and language uh, and interactions between people from different cultures and different countries. Um, I think historically, one of the one of the important issues is that we have always been a nation of missionaries. Uh, literally, uh, in, in our earlier years, of uh, literally religious missionaries uh, uh, who would go out into the world and who felt they had a responsibility uh, that America was a shining city on a hill, blessed of God. Uh, and our role was to uh, convert the rest of the world to our uh, our ways of thinking uh, in, in order to save them. Uh, and that's been a strong strain in American history all along. Uh, it's certainly uh, informed uh, American relations with China 
was among the first Americans to uh, to go to China, uh, were enormous numbers of missionaries, and they had an incredible impact on mm -hmm. um, on Chinese culture. Um, you know, over the last 250 years or so. Um, so there's that element. Uh, some of that, uh, I think, has been helpful. Uh, a lot of it has uh, has been naive uh, and and damaging. Um, the idea that uh, that we have figured out the right way to do things because we are the most powerful and the richest country on earth uh, so that uh, we have an obligation or, or a right uh, to, to tell other people what to do. Uh, and, uh, and it also uh, results in a kind of naive, naivete that for instance, uh, we can go into a country where there's a civil war uh, and uh, invade militarily and occupy the country uh, and give them money to fix things up. Uh, and uh, they will automatically become a democratic uh, capitalist country, uh, just like we are. Uh, and that's a, uh, uh, that I have to say, characterizes most of the, the American presidents uh, and, and, uh, and most of the American political discourse. Uh, and, uh, and we ought to know by now that that doesn't work. It didn't work in Vietnam. Uh, it didn't work in Afghanistan. Uh, it didn't work in Central America. Uh, and, uh, and in a lot of cases, it made those situations worse. Uh, there are things that I, that I think are very beneficent. I think the Peace Corps overall has done a good job. Uh, but I also think the, there are problems with the Peace Corps, and uh, and I think there are negative results of, of what the Peace Corps has done too. But that's one of the better examples. Um, and uh, let me interrupt and ask you this, though, uh, uh, Doc, because interesting you mentioned the Peace Corps. There's been a lot of controversy out there that you know when these somewhat privileged kids. I'm using generalization here, but it, you know, for lack of better terms, these privileged white kids go to these foreign countries and they party it up like crazy <laughs> and, you know, leaving a not great impression on, you know, where they are supposed to be ostensibly doing other types of things. Who's attracted to this kind of work these days? I, I guess that's where, that's where I'm kind of going here. You know, have we come through a phase where that element's sort of washing out and it's just a more serious type of student or other that's getting into this kind of foreign aid work now? Have you noticed any differences recently? Um, I have definitely noticed differences recently in students. Uh, uh, the students that I'm teaching now and have for the last four or five years uh, are, uh, are dramatically more serious, uh, dramatically more idealistic, uh, and, uh, and for the most part are people who uh, really want to make a difference in the world and are looking for a way of doing that. Uh, it's, it's a totally different group of students than I remember 10 or 15 years ago. And, uh, and uh, 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 anybody I think who's taught for very long, um, you know, can, can tell your stories about that too. But I'm very impressed with the current group of students. I've worked with uh, many, many students who've gone into Peace Corps and I've encouraged students to go into Peace Corps. Uh, I don't uh, necessarily buy the thing about partying. I don't, uh, I haven't seen that personally. Uh, I'm sure it exists. I mean, they're young people. Uh, but uh, but most of the people uh, that I've known who've gone to the Peace Corps and come back from the Peace Corps have been very serious. Uh, they have been people who had very good intentions and thought they were going to get a lot done. Uh, and in lots of cases, they come up against reality uh, about what they're doing. Um, a lot of uh, returned Peace Corps volunteers that I know will tell you that the things that they were sent to do to the, uh, by the Peace Corps were not the things that people wanted in those countries or needed in those countries. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and in a lot of cases, they, uh, they adapted what they were doing uh, to things that they thought were helpful in, the, in those communities. Uh, 
most of the people I know, who, and I'm not speaking for Peace Corps volunteers because I'm sure. not one, mm -hmm. but, uh, but a, a lot of people that I've talked to who have come back uh, have told me that they felt that they did not do very much for the places that they were sent. But those places did so much for them. Uh, and the value of the Peace Corps was the, the, the things that they learned that they were able to bring back and apply in their lives uh, and in their jobs uh, in the United States. Uh, so I think uh, I, I think that's one of the successes of the Peace Corps. Oh, there's value in that. There's no no question. Absolutely, there's value in that. Uh, Dr. Martin, have you noticed a? Um, and I know I'm kind of going around a poll here, but just a difference in how younger people are approaching this idea of being international or being connecting with others in another place now. And it's hard to kind of factor in COVID and, you know, that's whole stopper right there. But I, I'm curious if, if you're noticing the same thing as uh, Dr. Uh, what we were just speaking about a second ago, that there's been a difference the last five or six years or so. If I've new, let's see, there's so much here to unpack. Again, it's another complicated yeah. subject. I, I, I would agree with um, Ken, because we work with some of these students in global education and learning. And, but I would say that the students who are most attracted to this now are students, they're not students of color. Oh, interesting, okay. For the most part. Um, huh. It seems to be among students who would, who would typically classify themselves street race as being white. So it's good to see this, this opening, this global awareness on that level, and global learning connections. Um, it doesn't really happen with many African-American students until they've taken Africana studies or black studies in some ways, you know, where they're introduced to the diaspora and the fact that, you know, that Brazil has, you know, a larger African descent population than Nigeria, outside of Nigeria. So you hit them with different things to let them think that there's a larger world here. But I think the thing that's most interesting is that when you introduce them to something that Du Bois said, in the souls of black folks, the issue of the color line being the, you know, the problem of the 20th century and how it's still the problem of the 21st century. And they begin to see things a little differently in that sense. Um, um, I've worked with many of the students in the Peace Studies Program with the Global Education Office. And um, it's good to see that students who don't define themselves as being a person of color have now had a sense of conscience and moral issues about trying to do things better. And some of them want to join the Peace Corps after that. Um, but it's going to take a lot more work, you know, as, as we undo this. And I think it, it happens because of, you know, the exposures to other types of things. And I think some ways, th this is why some people may fear critical race theory, uh, mm -hmm. even though it's not really being taught in high schools or things of that nature. But the thing that, that grabs me the most about critical race theory, I mean, many of the tenants do, which was borrowed from Du Bois, but this notion of interest convergence. And people who have power are not going to do anything unless it benefits them. And so that's the frustration. I've seen a lot of students in the Peace Corps see that frustration about, I've been sent to a rural area to help with water issues, other types of things. And I've learned more from the people than I've taught them because, you know, because we have the technical resources and other resources, but people do what they do best with what little they have. So um, it, it's challenging, but you see. Is that, that, a fair, is that a fair trade? Do both countries win out? I mean, it's great to have these American kids filled up and coming back. Well, it, it, it really you know, left anything of any note in that exchange. Qui, qui, bono, qui bono, who benefits? I think yeah. the students from America who benefit from that situation develop a sense of, of not feeling, most who do that come back with less of a feeling of white supremacy. Let me put it that way in plain terms. Okay. They, 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 they understand their privilege and their positionality in a much different way. Um, and, and that's a good thing in many ways. Um, so um, who benefits? Um, obviously, you know, people maybe in a rural village may benefit from an intervention that was taking place by, you know, several students. But at large, the country still suffers because it's still under the throes of the International Monetary Fund and all kinds of other forces which are viewed, which are weighed against them in many ways. And so this notion of American exceptionalism um, seems to be broken down some of students who feel that way, who go through that. Um, you know, it's, um, again, I've said this several times before, it, it's complicated. Um, but I do think that students are becoming more cosmopolitan in their perspectives. And I'm glad that we're having this conversation things now because in two weeks from now, I have to do a special lecture, you know, selfish promo here for international relations program. And my program is called Black Internationalism, Global Affairs and Black Lives Matters. And, and in that, I want to show this notion of how um, people of African descent in America have always seen themselves, you know, until it was beaten out of them, the sense of their Africanness and identity, something that Dr. Reed spoke about before that is so problematic for both sets. And um, with that notion, 
we've always been engaged in this process of seeing the other and seeing the humanity of others and recognizing that it came forth with SNCC. It came through the Black Panthers to understand the outreach to the world. And, and students are surprised to see, to hear about those particular programs because all they ever taught is the civil rights movement. They aren't talking about the work of SNCC and the Black Panthers and other groups who said, this is international, this is global, how we perceive this and how we look at this. And where do you see yourself in the world as being a person of African descent? So um, I think the root causes of so much of this is still the Eurocentric education that says Europe is the center of the world. And the fact that when you look at the roots of white supremacy and the issue of the lost cause, which is resurrecting now in terms of neo-Confederacy, those issues, you see the three characteristics of whiteness as an ideology, not as a skin color, but as an ideology, which is so dangerous. And you see that it leads to irrationality. It leads to stunting of intellectual growth and development, and it negates democracy. So how are we going to tell democracy, preach democracy to other people when we still don't do it right ourselves? When we still, you know, put forth all these notions of oppression in terms of ageism, sexism, ableism, disability issues, language issues, you know? And so my patent remark, you've heard me say this before, Gene, our biggest enemies are fear, doubt, yeah. ignorance, superstition, apathy, and irreverence. And we can over, only overcome them with truth, justice, mercy, and compassion. And so um, it can't be done from a historical perspective. You know, as we talk about the colonized nations, we think about the three C's that took place at the Berlin Conference. We got to colonize these people because we need their resources and we need to sell our products in another country. We need to Christianize these people so they'd be more like us. And we need to civilize them. But as John Henry Clark said, civilization is the art of being civilized. You don't civilize people by, you know, oppressing them and subordinating them and subjecting them to all kinds of horrors and things. So we got a long way to go in terms of how we talk about promoting a peace and justice and undoing structural violence. And I think it does start with the students because there's a new program put forth by the American uh, Association of Colleges and Universities, and they call it LEAP, a Liberal Education for America's Promise. Now, there may be some, some gaps and things with that, but I always believe in disruptive innovations. But one of the things that's interesting about this is that, and we've done some of this at UNM here now, where for the last two years we had, as a faculty fellow in general education, I work with others and we set up a program to teach students about um, racism and social justice and about global awareness and learning. And so students, when they first come into college, they have to take a course that helps them deal with um, cultural diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and issues related to humanity in their first year of college. Now, as I've told the medical students when I work with them, what we've basically given them is a, is a social inoculation, but they're gonna need booster shots along the way, which means that we're gonna have to reform the system in other ways and have other pe people there to teach and guide these students through this process. So um, again, this is about having the dialogues about what this all means and, and what is connected in terms of another key point from the boys here that I like to phrase in the sacredness of diversity. It's yeah. not just not about quotas and affirmative action. There's something much more sacred about diversity that people are overlooking. And I think some of the students see this as we talk about sustainability issues and other types of things. And more and more students of color are waking up to that too, particularly those who don't see themselves as descendants of indigenous people but recognizing that knowledge that's been stolen and, and co-opted and, and pimped off to do terrible things in the world. Um, so um, with growing awareness, you know, we'll get there. We'll pass it on to the next generation. You know, as Ismael Reed's generation has passed on things to me as a young person, and I pass it on to other people, and we, and we do this because um, we're standing on the backs of so many people who sacrificed to get where we are. And so we have to do this for the next generation. That's right. That's right. Dr. Reed, how are you feeling about the next generation? What, in your universe, who are you feeling? You, you're optimistic? What's your sense? Well, I, I wonder how many uh, students have left the country. Uh -huh. mm. I think that, uh, I think that uh, Canada has uh, seen a rise in immigration from the United States. I teach at uh, California College of the Arts, but I went back to Berkeley for a semester. And uh, I'm wondering how students feel about uh, how inexorable or the solid wall of racism. You had thousands of them demonstrate all over the world for police reform after the killing of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Yet the neo-Confederate caucus just turned down any attempt at reforming the okay. police today or yesterday. I don't yesterday. know. Yesterday. Yep. That's right. Thank you for mentioning that. That's exactly the most right. Powerful entity in this country uh, is the uh, police law enforcement. Uh, 
they still have their what, qualified immunity. Yep. They've given these guys an okay to go out and kill whomever you wish. Not just blacks. The typical victim of a police shooting is a Native American. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Out here, they kill Hispanics, you know, regularly, like in mm -hmm. Sacramento and mm -hmm. there have been cases in, uh, on YouTube mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, unarmed Hispanics being murdered. So I'm wondering how, how they understand or how they are, are able to deal with power. And instead of going around the world trying to promote democracy, I'm wondering if uh, Biden is Hindenburg or somebody. You know, he says that the Democrats don't seem to have any fire in the belly to take on these fascists. As a matter of fact, the media created Donald Trump for ratings. They said that. They admitted it. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Zucker, when mm -hmm. he left uh, uh, C-SPAN, he said, you know, we created him. And then when he became president, they made money denouncing him. Okay? So they made money creating him. And now they're making money denouncing him. And you hear more about him than Biden. That's right. Because every, it's like watching somebody going across the Grand Canyon on a wire on, with his head on a bicycle seat or something. Everybody's waiting for the trickster to fall. There's big money in that. So we're very much, I think for the next decades or so, we're going to try to resist a white nationalist takeover. And they're at work to do this. And, and this attorney general is so passive. I said, maybe it's a good idea this guy didn't get on Supreme Court. He probably, he probably would have voted with the conservatives. I mean, it's just, it's just a mess. So how are we going to, how are we going to maintain democracy uh, in this country? I think that's a big question. It's a very good question. You know, we're just coming out of four years of Trump, uh, Dr. Reed. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I'm just curious your take at, while we got you here, the bruise he left on this nation is well, the media still... giving him the shadow government. That's right. The media has awarded him a government in exile. I mean, he's on all day. And he knows how to manipulate the media, you know, uh, because that's his thing, manip manipulating the New York media, which is great training ground. Mm -hmm. And so uh, mm -hmm. he knows how to keep their attention by saying stupid and outrageous things to get their attention. Right. So I don't know how we're going to get out of this. Uh, I wish maybe Pamela uh, would, you know, the vice president would uh, pick up, you know, or make more statements or get into the, I don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, th that's interesting. Isn't that the same thing that Goebbels and Hitler said? about fascism, everything we learned about this in eugenics, we learned from America. Oh, absolutely. You sure this white nationalist movement is also taking rise in Europe. So, you know, where do you, where do you, where do you go to under that specter? You know, I mean, this is something that's always plagued African-Americans. Do we stay home or, and fight or do we go elsewhere? Well, the black people in Berlin are carrying knives. <laughs> you know, the last time I was there, there was a big neo-fascist uh, ride on the subway. Yes. So, you know. Ouch. Yeah, that's, well, a good, uh, that's a good point. It's, it's global. That's a good point that not many people know that Hitler admired sterilization, you know, mm -hmm. concentration camps, Native Americans. He learned a lot of his techniques from here. And mm -hmm. with that in mind, people are still discussing the bell curve. Mm. <clears throat> right. That was sponsored by a Hitler admirer. Mm -hmm. He's the uh, New England industrialist, the Pioneer Fund, finding mm -hmm. the bell curve, mm -hmm. and a couple of his friends were hanged at Nuremberg. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Why, why that, connection. It's interesting that some of the same type of funding, those sources like that also sponsored the Tuskegee 626 trials. Absolutely. And people don't realize that. You know, they yeah, funded yeah. the CDs, they funded the United States Public Health Service to do that. <clears throat> yeah. So there's a, you know, like you said earlier, there's a lot to unpack <laughs> in all these issues. Yeah. yeah. I wanted Can't to say one more. Please. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say one more thing about why I'm, uh, I think, optimistic about the future uh, because of the young people uh, that I see uh, working. And I want to kind of take it back to the, the, uh, the Muhammad Ali film, which was one of the things about uh, Muhammad Ali was that he was young, he was idealistic, uh, he was authentic, uh, he was a genius at uh, manipulating the media. Uh, 
he knew how to be a lovable uh, bad guy. Uh, and uh, and he uh, was a transformative force in a lot of ways, uh, not just by the civil rights movement and the, and the anti-war movement, but his impact on sports uh, and, uh, and dealing with racism in sports. Uh, and I see the successors to him these days, uh, but primarily um, in, in the sports world, uh, I'm, I'm seeing women, uh, transgender uh, people, gay and lesbian uh, athletes, uh, and uh, I can see the same kind of spirit in them that, that, uh, that I think Ali had. Uh, and I think the big sports stories right now are that kind of transformation. Uh, and uh, I, if I look at Simone Biles and the, the women of the, uh, of the American gymnastics team uh, and their courage and their outspokenness, uh, and that's, uh, that's what Ali was trying to do, I think. And uh, I think we really need to, uh, to support them. Uh, those of us with an older generation who maybe know a little bit about history, uh, I don't think we need to tell them what to do, but I think we need to give them a lot of support uh, because I think they're the ones who are going to who are going to transform uh, these problems that we're facing today. Mm -hmm. I hope. Ken, that's mm -hmm. a good point. I, I told my students yesterday the very same thing. The question was asked of me, and I said, you know, this is up to you how you decide you want to handle this with the older folks here. We to help guide you and support you in that, to stand beside you, not to be in front of you or in behind you, but to gu help guide you with this as elders. And so, you know, one of the things, it does, get, it does give me a sense of optimism because I've never seen such student interest since like the 60s. And 68 was a very pivotal year all across the globe where students all over the globe were, you know, raising a fear about the injustices that existed, you know, in the suffering of human beings. And to see this resurrected again now with this younger group of students, we have to help support that and nurture that. So that they can give them the other tools and things they need so that they can continue to go forth with this and do the best they can until it's time for them to pass it on. Well, thanks, everybody, for bringing it back to Muhammad Ali. We have some uh, people also mentioning that in the audience. Um, it sounds like we could do a whole hour of more of conversation, but I want to thank everybody on the panel tonight for joining us. This has been really um, very fascinating conversation. Even, um, even though we had ranged away from Ali, I think that he provided a frame for us to have a great conversation. So thanks to everyone, especially thank you, Jamal, for partnering with me on this. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Jean, for your great moderation skills. Dr. Reed, I'm getting your book. I said I put in the chat over on the, in OV a link to the book, uh, <laughs> The Complete Life of Muhammad Ali. And uh, Ken Carpenter, thank you so much for kind of giving us the bookend for this conversation. I really appreciate it. Real quickly, I'm just going to share my screen and show everybody what this poster is going to look like. Um, and then I am going to use a, here we go, a, a random number generate, generator to uh, give a few people in the audience copies of this. We will mail it, I promise. Um, and I don't want to take a long time to do this because we promised you we'd be done at 8.30. Um, and so just a couple of questions. Um, Tresha Green, if you're in the audience, go ahead and pop something in the chat. Um, Maya, if you're in the audience, put something in the chat um, and we, we will try and get you one of these posters. Um, and let me see who else this is. Um, oh, why not? Stephen Jules Rubin. We'll, make, <laughs> we'll send you one too. Thank you so much for being at all four of these. And then one last person. Um, I don't think... Pamela Herndon, are you with us? Because I just got a, the number generation generator on you. Um, pop something in the chat for me if you are. Um, I'll make sure that all four of these go out. Um, and Gina, Jamal, you're going to get posters also, I promise. So thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, I really appreciate you all. This was an amazing conversation. 
Um, Dr. Reed, thanks for joining us from the West Coast. I really appreciate your hard work and you're holding all of our feet to the fire. So I appreciate that very much. All under, right. Good I'm night, everybody. I'm not under witness protection. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's dark. Yeah, you are kind of dark. You're going to have to do that. Kind of, uh, front you didn't light. disguise your voice. <laughs> you didn't disguise your voice, sir. <laughs> yeah. thank you thank you Ismail Reed thank you everyone I really appreciated this it's been a great experience these last few weeks and uh, I've come away extra charged and invigorated with new opportunities to kind of to do this work and thank you very much Laurel for you know bringing me aboard with this Ken Gene you're marvelous as always man um, I, I hope that sometime soon we can continue this conversation you know in another form as we move forward with all of this because there's work I, to be I, done. this would be a great launching point for a lot of, a lot of conversation absolutely we should we should think about that okay, okay. we yeah. will figure this out gene and i will conspire we'll call yeah. all of y'all back and we'll have another conversation and hopefully uh the people that are still in our audience will join us for that too how many, okay. how, many did, how many people do we have in the audience this time um, we had about 30 um, oh, okay. people in and out. It wasn't yeah. a huge audience, um, but they're starting to drop off now. <laughs> well, I, I imagine so. I mean, you know, they, most of them have probably seen the um, the documentary already, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gilbert was letting us know. I've seen all this. But, uh, what's next? Yeah, but, but it's the <laughs> panelists that matter. We're the ones that were taking it to the, taking it to the, well. That's anyway, right. Elsie. That's right. Yeah, never so mind. I hope if you Take have not everyone. seen um, the documentary yet that you can stream it for free on the PBS um, portal. And mm -hmm. so you can watch it. You can even uh, binge. Is that what they say? You can binge on it if you want to. So thanks again, everybody. Thank for you. Peace and blessings, everyone. Take care. Absolutely. Okay. Good yeah. night, y'all. Hi, I'm your director, Tom Dent. I'm here with our resident troubadour, Matt Johns. We're going to sing a song to end the show to honor marijuana. This April 1st, marijuana becomes legal in New Mexico. And in the next couple of shows, we're going to get, try to get people from the state, city, and local reporters to talk about legalization and the laws that go with it. So here we go. Homegrown's all right with me. Homegrown is the way it should be. Homegrown is a good thing. Plant that bell and let it ring. Sun comes up in the morning, shines that light around. One day without no warning, things start jumping up from the ground cause homegrown's all right with me homegrown is the way it should be homegrown is a good thing plant that bell and let it ring Homegrown's all right with me. Homegrown is the way it should be. Homegrown is a good thing. Plant that bell and let it ring. Until the next time, it's time to say goodbye. When you out here in the streets, keep it real, 505. We love everybody. We just want to let you know. Thanks for tuning in to that Saturday show.